Hello, everyone. Welcome to Looking to the East. I'm your host, Steven Zerker. Our show focuses on a variety of issues, mostly in the Japan, Korea area. Uh, we talk about politics and um, other uh, pursuits as well. Today, we're focusing on something a little lighter than most of the shows that have been on Think Tech. Obviously, most are focusing on political conditions in Europe right now. But we're looking at something that uh, I think will be maybe a bit more enjoyable to learn about. We're going to be looking at baseball, America's pastime, as it's played in Asia, in Japan, and also in Korea. We have two very special guests with us for this show. We have Jerry Sands. Jerry is a former uh, player in Japan and Korea, a professional baseball player. And uh, we're going to talk with him about his experiences of playing baseball both in the United States and in Asia. And we have uh, Trevor Raichura. Trevor is an educator like myself here in Japan. And his side job, or maybe Trevor, it is your main job, is uh -huh. uh, promoting uh, Hanching Tigers English News, which focuses on one of the most popular baseball teams in Japan in the Kansai area where both Trevor and I live. Thank you guys very, very much for participating in the show today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yeah, Thanks for so Jerry, me. yeah, you're, you're welcome. Jerry, why don't we start with you? Um, I did a little research about you. I saw that you had played, uh, you played professional baseball now for 14 years altogether. Um, you were drafted in 2008 in the 25th round. Uh, I don't think they do that anymore, right? I think MLB has eliminated those later round drafts now, but you got in and you ended up uh, going into professional baseball in the United States, both as a minor and the major league level. Right. And then, yes, after, <clears throat> after a number of years of doing that, then you turned your career to international playing here in Asia. <clears throat> so let's start with how you developed your love of baseball and um, you know, how that led to your entering the major leagues. Can, did you start baseball when you were young, like uh, many kids in the United States? Yeah, I think I was just kind of the, the usual story of um, growing up. And uh, my dad was not much of an athlete, but uh, he obviously wanted us to be involved in sports. He, he believes in it uh, quite a bit when it comes to the teamwork and uh, the work ethic. And um, him and my mom are both blue collar. So uh they just, like I said, pushed us towards um, playing sports. And they always kind of said, like, it, you don't have to have a job and we'll support you if you're playing sports and you're you're working wow. hard at it. Um, Wonderful parents. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and I still, <laughs> like I said, in the summers, I was still working. I still worked at, my mom worked at a little farmer's market. I still worked at the farmer's market. And in high school, I worked with my now wife's, uh, my father-in-law. And he was putting in septic tanks. So I still, I still had to, to work and like I said, I still had to, if I wanted to do things and put gas in my truck to, to run around in high school, I needed some, a little bit of extra change. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it wasn't a, it, my brother and I, I've got a younger brother, he's two years younger, and we just kind of the same thing. I mean, we grew up uh, playing sports, competitive. We had a neighborhood and played sports and mm -hmm. um, baseball and football were the two that really stuck with me. I was the best at mm -hmm. and I uh, just kind of ran them on and went into high school, like I said, playing football and baseball and uh, actually had more offers to go to, uh, to play football in college than I did baseball. But really, I just kinda, yeah, I just kind of looked longevity and um, pro potential. I mean, obviously everybody says I want to be a pro baseball player, but um, mm -hmm. realistically it, it's a very long shot. So, I mean, I knew that obviously I wanted to go and I wanted to be able to kind of walk after I played college ball. So I wanted to play, I wanted to play baseball. Um, and like I said, hoping, hoping the professional levels would, would pan out. I thought baseball was my best bet. So I decided to go play baseball. And then, um, I went to a little small division two school. Um, that's a real long story why I ended up there, but I just got the opportunity to play and they wanted me. So I went and, uh, played mm -hmm. three years, played really well, and then, uh, got drafted and ended up playing pro ball. And, um, even getting drafted, it's another long story of kind of getting overlooked and, uh, ended up until the 25th round and, um, just decided I, I needed to make the most of it and uh, go ahead and get my foot in the door in pro baseball. And, um, I debuted in the big leagues three years later. So, yeah, um, you, you know, you raise the point of how difficult it is to get into the majors, but you did it. Yeah. And there's not a lot of people from the 25th round that make it into the 
into the big show and you, you did do that. So that's a remarkable accomplishment. So when you were drafted 25th, was, uh, were you excited that you were drafted or were you disappointed it was so far down or how did you feel about that at the time? It was, it was definitely mixed. Um, mm -hmm. It, the process is crazy. I mean, you, you go, I went to numerous, um, they have these pre-draft out pre-draft workouts where they invite you people. They kind of want to see a little bit more of. Um, so I went to a few of those and talked to scouts and scouts. They're all, I mean, it's a business. So they're trying to get you as cheap as possible. And then we're trying to obviously set up our future. So we don't want to go as cheap as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's one of those games you kind of play with each other of, how much you do you want? What do you want? And a lot of times, obviously, when you get drafted higher, you make more money. So they want to know where they can possibly draft you the lowest and still get you um, and pay you the least amount of money. But at the same point in time, they want to make sure they get you. So it's a big game. I don't know if something got caught up in that, but I, I had the impression that I was going to go much earlier than that. Mm -hmm. um, and I was playing summer baseball at the time and the coach gave me the day off because it was kind of known that I was going to get drafted who knows when but I knew I was going to get drafted at some point mm -hmm. so he gave me the day off to kind of enjoy it and I, I sat at the computer and listened for my name for a few hours <laughs> and uh and once yeah. it started getting later and later I, it I was pretty annoyed and I told my dad let's get ready to go and I was going to pack up my stuff and I was going to go play the game that night mm -hmm. And uh, ended up getting the call that I was going to get drafted and once again it's I was still upset because they had told me I was supposed to go earlier and mm -hmm. um, so you, again, you were, money's, yeah. money's going out the window and different things. But I, but I ended up, obviously I, I kind of, I kind of just realized I can't do a whole lot more in college. I need to go ahead and like I said, get my foot in the door in pro ball. And you were drafted by the Dodgers, was it? The Dodgers. Yes, sir. Okay. Very good. All right. So that started your professional career then uh, in the Dodgers uh, minor leagues, I would assume is where you got started. And you said three years after that, you actually were, were called up to play. Right. Yeah. The three, Dodgers three yourself. I mean, right. So despite, despite the maybe kind of a little bit of a rocky start, you were able to move up to the major level and actually start in a, or play in a, a Dodgers game. That must have right. been incredible. Yeah, it, was, it was crazy. So it was, it was a lot yeah. of fun, but it, it flew by real, really, really quick. Okay. All right. So um, I do want to talk about your international career. I think uh, sure. since I'm, my show is focusing on Asia and so forth, and you did have a professional career here, what led you to begin to think about moving to Asia and playing baseball here? Did you know that baseball was played in here? I'm, sometimes I'm, I'm, I don't know if Americans know that baseball is actually played outside of America. Yeah. Or Canada, yeah. too. Sorry, Trevor. I'm, I got to include Canada. <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> I think Mr. Baseball kind of gives it away for a, a lot of the, a lot of us. Okay. Like I said, I, I know I was, I'm probably just on the age bracket that really knows, you know what I mean? Mr. Baseball is getting a little bit older for some of these younger guys now, I think. So I don't even know if a lot of guys have probably seen it, um, mm -hmm. but I've seen it quite a few times. So I obviously knew about Asian baseball and I knew mm -hmm. there was a little bit different culture. Um, once I got into pro ball, I, I started learning a little bit more. And especially once I got, kind of to the big leagues and triple a um, to where you get to that age and that kind of category of guys that are um, really not sure where their career is going or where they're at in their career. And you kind of mm -hmm. are like, I, I would like to go to Asia um, mm -hmm. to obviously for your career wise and, and just opportunity, but also monetarily, you want to make a little bit of money before you get out of the game. Mm -hmm. um, there's such a short window that you have to take advantage of it. So Right. Um, like I said, once I started hanging around with a little more company and uh, like I said, in AAA, you get guys that might have been over to Asia and then they come back and they sign with a AAA or or different things. So I, I started learning a little bit more about it. And then uh, mm -hmm. before I ended up going to Korea, a couple of years before that, uh, Oryx actually was talking to me in Japan and they they were talking about me going over there. And I so you were being scouted. I was being scouted before. Yeah. A couple of years before and the Indians wouldn't let me go at the time. Um, okay. And uh, so that kind of fell through. They ended up signing Brent Morrell and a couple of guys. Mm -hmm. um, so that didn't go through, but I ended up, obviously I was still on the radar, I think over there. And, and it was obviously on my radar because I, like I said, you have such a short window and you kind of get that clock on you. Of, um, this is kind of where I'm at in my career. 
Mm -hmm. Do I want to keep scraping and try to make it over here? Or do I just want to at the triple A level at the triple A level? Or, I mean, for me, it went from big leagues, triple A to, I couldn't find a job in 2017, two years after, uh -huh. two years after Oryx was looking at me, I couldn't find a job mm -hmm. and I ended up playing an independent ball. And then I went to double A back to double A when I was, you know, I mean, 27 years old. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it goes really quick. So uh, once I got to that point, I was like, any any opportunity I can get in Asia, I want to take advantage of it. Obviously, I wanted to be, you know, what I mean, get be engulfed in the culture. I thought it was a really cool experience. But I also had you been to Asia before? Or? I had not. No, I've. I've but you I've, were interested in it. Yeah, I was just interested. I've heard a lot of things, um, mm -hmm. and I like I said, and in 2012, I played with. Um, I think it was 2012. I played with Josh Fields, who played for. Um, uh, Tokyo who played third base for Tokyo and he ended up being a scout for him after that and stuff, but played with him. So I got to talk to him about, um, Japan and, um, I, I can't remember who else I, I played with a few different players, um, that played over there and then came back. So I, once again, um, Brett Leach was over here. Like I said, I can't think of all the players, but I know yeah, there seems to be a, a circulation but, now of, of players coming to Japan and going back. Right. Yeah. Or, or getting, like I said, coming to Japan or going to Korea and getting a better opportunity after they go. So a lot of right. times beforehand, it was kind of like the end of your career. If you were coming over here, not that you were coming over here to die, but it was your career was kind of on that. You were just trying to scrape a little bit more. And now it's like you can come over here and, and rejuvenate your career. I mean, you got the Marcus Timms and the guys that come over here and, and not Marcus Timms, excuse me, Eric Thames that come over here that that come over here and um and play really well and go back and make a lot of money. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of, a lot of guys are going back. Um, and, and that's one uh, thing I want to talk with you about is, is uh, like Carter Stewart, the Carter Stewart. draft. Yeah. Drafty out of uh, university who turned down his opportunity to play in the majors and came here. But before I do that, just tell me briefly about, you know, you arrive in Korea and you know, I've been to games in Korea. It's an, it's an unbelievable, the stadium atmosphere. Right. So what, what was uh, your impressions? And uh, maybe we can lump that into playing the Koshien. Koshien is the stadium where the Hanshin Tigers play. I mean, my goodness, right. that must have been wonderful. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. And, and once again, you have the uh, you see the movies or people tell you about it, but then you get into the ac actual stadium and you've got the, the cheerleaders and the fans and every every player has a song coming coming up to bat and all the fans know it and mm -hmm. um you know and you got the glitter jerseys and everybody's got different guys and the pictures and the you know it's they are really they are really all about it and uh and they're true fans um and that's that's what was really cool about it like i said they come to the game and they actually pay attention and they actually care um in the states it's kind of like you might be a a fan of a team um but you, you don't go to the game and you go to the game hoping they're going to win but you don't go to the game hoping that that pitcher for your team that day is going to do really well and, and number one through nine in that lineup is going to do really well it seems like the asian culture when they go to the obviously hunching tiger fans they definitely want you to win but they also feel it, it's a different feeling and in korea it's a different feeling that they're they're there to to watch you support you and um it's a it's a lot of fun mm, yeah so um off there's a lot of books written like Whiting's books and so forth that talk about the dynamics of baseball in japan versus the united states so, and one of the things that uh, the sports journalists talk about when they're talking to foreign players is the adjustments that have you have to make uh, either because the pitching's different or the way the game is played. You seem to have done a very good job, uh, you know, I'm watching you at Hanshin and I'm sure you did the same thing in Korea. Did you, can you describe briefly some of the adjustments you had to make as you played ball internationally as opposed to in the States? Cool. Yeah, I mean, first of all, you just have to get over the, the culture differences. Um, once again, it, it's just – and I, I compare it, obviously, like a Dominican player comes to the United States. Yeah. So there's some differences there. They have to adjust, uh, and I have to adjust. Um, you're in a different country. They do get things different. So I would always tell if I ever got – like I said, once I felt like I was a veteran after you get about – three months in the country you feel like you can tell somebody else what what to do when they come in but if you if i ever got on first base with another foreign guy or whatever they were new or i just i would always tell them like don't sweat the small stuff like 
the mm-hmm. Korean culture does things how they want to do it. And they kind of expect you, you're in their country. So you should, you should try to abide by that and don't sweat the small stuff, just go with it. And, um, and I'm pretty easy going. And so that really didn't bother me a whole lot when it came to the culture of how they do things or, um, then you go into the baseball culture of how they practice, how they pitch, how they prepare, how they, and it's the same way. It's like you get yourself ready, but at the same point in time, you can't get worked up about, I, I used to do it this way. I do, I do it this way. Like you get yourself prepared how you need to, but at the same point in time, you have to show them a little bit of respect of, of, uh, of that's how they've done it for however long the game has been played over there. You know what I mean? So, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. No, you did a good job. I mean, I've, I've been living in Japan and I watch baseball. I remember Kevin Mitchell, you know, the famous San Francisco giant. Uh, he was a uh, MVP. He was only here a couple of months. <laughs> he just all yeah. of a sudden oh, yeah. disappeared. And that happens every once in a while. The players will come over here and they just don't find it comfortable and they take off. So that's to your credit that you were able to adjust and thrive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like I said, it's a different lifestyle. It's a different and especially if guys have have played in the big leagues a long time and they get over here and it's not quite the same in Korea, you carry your own bags everywhere you go. And you, you know, it's just, it's, Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. You well, like simple stuff. You get changed at the hotel and you wear your Jersey to the field and then you pack up your stuff and you get it back on the bus in your Jersey and you go back to the hotel and you, mm. you know I mean? You put your laundry in the hallway. That's how they do it in Asia. They, they have mm-hmm. showers and they have post-game meals in the States. And so it's just, di- some of the things are different, but it, it's not, it's not that in the grand scheme, it's not that big of a deal. And you just kind of adjust. And I, I had a blast. I loved it. I, I, I loved both. I loved experiencing new cultures. I loved meeting the guys. I mean, everybody, like I said, you don't meet many, real bad people uh when it comes to um the asian culture everybody's there um mm-hmm. to do their job and that's mm-hmm. how a lot of the asians that between the koreans and the japanese the players look at it it's more of their job they're serious about it in the states there's a lot of entitlement and a lot of um egos and and things like that so i enjoyed it everybody was there to, to work hard and and do your job and win games and and that's that's kind of my my mo and that's my my personality so i loved it mm. all right I'm gonna switch over to trevor trevor let's talk about uh, your website uh the promotion that you do of the hanshin tigers uh focusing on those of us that are living here in japan that, that are not fluent in japanese it's uh a great service that you do. So tell me, uh, how did you get interested in doing this yourself? Uh, you're a Canadian, so maybe baseball's not your first go-to sport, but it's become your go-to sport here. So tell us about your site. I know you're exactly right that baseball uh, wasn't on my radar really until I came to Japan. And then NPB in particular wasn't on my radar until like around 2014, maybe 2013, like my first true um enjoyable experience of Japanese baseball and not to say I hated it before, but I just didn't pay much attention to it was the 2013 Japan series where Tanaka uh, got that save in game seven against the giants after having pitched a complete game loss in game six. It was just really, yeah, was dramatic. Like, yeah really exciting. And then <laughs> Um, I was just at a stage in my career as a teacher where I wasn't getting much fulfillment out of what I was doing. Um, and one of my friends who's kind of a career coach said, well, why don't you, what's, what's your, what would you like to do? And I was like, well, I always wanted to be a sports journalist. And so he just gave me, he plugged he put that little bug in my ear. Like, well, why don't you try doing that? Like just on the side, just do a blog for like, I don't know the tigers or something. And really until then I hadn't paid much attention to the tigers. And so, um, that little plug from my friend was really what got me started. And I said, okay, well, I'll start with just the foreign players. Like I'll focus on them because they're the ones that maybe need some exposure in English that they're not getting um, both for fans uh, Mm -hmm. that might be here. And also for like their families and friends back home where like at the time it was Matt Merton and Randy, Randy messenger were the two um, Americans on the tigers team. And I was thinking to myself, well, their families probably don't get to hear very much about what's going on with, with their man, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the impetus. And I was like, well, maybe if I got something going here, it might be, it might be interesting and, and useful for them. And on the whole, like, I feel like what I'm doing here, like, even though it started as 
me uh, needing a distraction from my career or my job. It really is a service. It's a service for the players' families. It's a service mm-hmm. for the fan base that is small, but um, it is growing and it has so much potential to grow. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that's where yeah, I, I think get you, motivation you, from. Your original visions worked out because sometimes uh, I'll look at the comments from the viewers uh, or the people who are reading uh, the various information that you provide through Twitter and and whatnot. And there will be family members from the States that are making comments uh, about the players and so forth. So I think it definitely worked out that way. Now, when I started, I got this idea for the show, uh, the MLB was in a lockdown. So uh, Jerry, you you must be happy that that's, you know, your buddies and so forth are happy that that has finally been resolved. Um, So I was hoping maybe I could promote Japanese baseball as an alternative because I remember Korean baseball took off when COVID stopped the major league or major season for a while. Um, But major league has fixed to their problems. The owners have allowed the players to play, it looks like. But uh, for those uh, viewers that are interested in learning more about Japanese baseball, obviously there's your website to go to. Uh, are there other websites that you would recommend, or let's say someone in America actually wants to watch a Japanese game? Are there ways to do that that you know of? So unfortunately, it's a bit complicated. Um, just as a very kind of rudimentary guide, um, NPB has two leagues, just like MLB, but there are only six teams in each league. So there's the mm-hmm. Pacific League, which has the DH, the Central League, which doesn't have the DH. That's like the basic divider between the two. Um, obviously, now in MLB, everyone's got the DH, but um, the Pacific League um, works on the same page with one another, those six clubs, and they've got something called Pacific League TV. So if you subscribe to that, I think it's like somewhere around 16 bucks a month. You mm-hmm. can watch all of the games that they play. Plus, I think you can get the interleague schedule as well. But the Central League, unfortunately, they are just not a united front. And so it's almost like every team for themselves. And the Tigers have got a streaming service, which is only available for home games plus games at Tokyo Dome. And then I think the Giants have a service as well, but it's like three times the cost of the Tigers one. And who wants to follow them anyways? Um, And so and I think a couple other teams have their own little services as well. Now, if you're in Japan, there's also um, something called Dazon, D-A-Z-N. For Americans, it's a Z, I guess. Um, and I think that's about 20 bucks a month. And you get streaming. You can stream games and also watch archives for 11 different teams. So there are options, but it's just not as straightforward as it is in America with MLB TV. Right. <clears throat> as for like websites and stuff, um, the NPB has an English side to their page, but it's not very well updated. Oh, it's, it's awful. Not, it's not super it's visually appealing. It's, it's awful. They need to hire somebody. Is what they need. To do. <laughs> they need to hire um, you, Trevor. <laughs> I wouldn't mind that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then also, there's um, if if you are on Reddit, there is a sub for NPB, and there are some pretty good updates in there. And there is also a live box score website. I'll give you the link later, Steve. But um, okay, it's, it it you can follow along live with what's going on in the games. Um, okay. And it's all in English. So, yeah. right. All right. So let's, uh, let's loop back, uh, Jerry, to the thing we were addressing earlier, and that's development of uh, young players. You, you said that traditionally, also in your case, uh, you decided when you reached uh, a certain age, you know, 27, 28, I think you mentioned that you wanted to consider playing baseball in, in Asia. But how about the question of Given your experience in the minors and your experience here in Asia, do you think that there may be it may be advisable in some cases for uh, talent that is coming out of the American university system or maybe other places like maybe Dominican as well to come into Japan to begin their careers rather than the kind of pattern where players are coming in towards the latter stage of their career? If you compare your experience in Japan to your experience in the minors. Do you think there's a place for younger players here like Carter Stewart has done with SoftBank? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a place. Um, it's just a, it's a, it's, it's tough because for a player, um, Carter, I mean, obviously he, he got paid really well. I think he signed like a six year deal. He was supposed to get, I think he got pretty similar to what he was supposed to get for a sign and bonus. Um, so with him, I mean, he's still making, I think, $6 million or something over five or six years, and then yeah. he'll be a free agent and he can go do whatever he wants to do. If he pitches well for SoftBank, 
they they might just break him off pretty good and he can just stay over here and make a career out of it or a lot of guys want to go back but <laughs> yeah it's it's a it's tough on for the player for one because um, a lot of times the team has to justify or the scout has to justify why they want to sign somebody. Um, mm. So like with me going to Korea, the team was interested in me, but they couldn't sign me. They, they say they couldn't sign me until I got, when they were looking at me, I was in double A. They couldn't sign me until I was promoted to triple A because they couldn't justify to their owner and to their people that were spending the money on me that I was worth the money and I was worth the time to go over there because I wasn't in triple A. I see. So, so some of these guys like Carter Stewart, obviously he was going to be a top 10 round pick. They were going to pay him millions of dollars. So SoftBank jumped on it and they said, well, we can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of these guys, these high school guys, if it's available to them, I mean, a team, once they sign you, I don't know how uh, in depth, you know, the, the kind of the, the MLB process or that minor league process. Once they, once they sign you from the, from the draft, they have you for like six years. Mm -hmm. um, so like I said, and that they kind of pay your, your, your signing bonus and installments over that time. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, either way, you're kind of locked in to one or the other teams. Obviously you're hoping to get to the major leagues as fast as possible and then get to your next contract. Mm -hmm. um, but either way, you're kind of stuck at some point for a few years um, I say stuck. I don't mean that, but for the most part, a lot of these guys are stuck. So mm -hmm. if they can go ahead and jump over here and make even more money or, or have better opportunity, um, some people might do it. Yeah. I think it's a, something that I wouldn't imagine possible uh, as I've watched baseball over the years here in Japan, but I, I don't know if what Carter Stewart did will be replicated with other players in the States yeah. that are highly touted will choose going into Nigun here in Japan, as opposed to going through the minor league experience. Which yeah. is and once, I mean, once again, he was a high school kid and he's got a, a lot of times you're nervous about leaving home and going to college. Yeah, three exactly. Hours, three hours away. He left home and went across the world to a different country. So that's something too, that these guys also have to get over. Like, Hey, is it really worth me? Not first of all, not living out the college experience or going to minor league ball, but I mean, I'm, I'm going across the world without my parents. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's a big one, too. Yeah. All right, we only have a few minutes left. The, the, the time when I do the show always flies by. And it's same thing with you guys again. The last question I have is um, regarding the internationalization. Obviously, Jerry, you have been very successful in creating an international career for yourself. But when I think about baseball a, as a whole, it really doesn't achieve the level of football. And by that, I mean soccer or rugby at the international stage. So maybe, uh, Trevor, you, you may have opinions about this. Uh, how can baseball, you know, you understand it in Japan, you understand it in Major League, how can baseball coordinate the league activity so there could be something like a true World Cup for, for baseball where, you know, not just a, a few million people, but hundreds of millions of people who are baseball fans worldwide potentially could enjoy that? Right. Well, I, th I think, first of all, baseball kind of falls victim to the similar conundrum that um, American football does in that it has a more traditional um, and much more popular cousin, right? With football, there's rugby that is a worldwide sport where what, like a lot of countries would say, why would we throw away rugby just to adopt football? And mm -hmm. I think cricket to an extent has a much greater global following than baseball. Mm -hmm. And the games are somewhat similar. And I think it's probably easier and cheaper to get a cricket team or league going. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing baseball kind of has working against it. But I also know that um, there is uh, somebody here in Japan who is from Sri Lanka. And he's actually done a lot of great work to promote the game back in his home country. And mm -hmm. he sends equipment and he sends um, coaches to his home country to do free clinics where kids can pick up, um, you know, real gloves and real bats and stuff and learn the game from people who are experienced in the game. So I think it requires a real grassroots effort uh, to go into these countries with equipment, with um, human resources that will enable the game to spread because 
on its own, it's not just going to automatically uh, take root in these countries where there is no familiarity with the game itself. So that right. would be, I think, the starting point that needs to uh, be given a serious look. Jerry, what do you think about, uh, I think one of the major reasons why baseball perhaps is not on the global par with rugby or other sports is that the United States, the MLB, really thinks about baseball with only within the terms of America and Canada. You know, for example, there is a world's games that occur, uh, but usually it's not the main players who go. It's It would be AAA players and so forth who end up going. So maybe part of the problem is that uh, Americans think about baseball only as an American sport and really don't see it on the, a global basis. Would you agree with that? Or do you think it can be internationalized potentially? Um, I, I think it, I think it could be a, li a little bit. I think I agree a lot with how Trevor said it is it's, it's exposure. It's um, it's the amount of people that you have. Um, baseball is not an easy sport to play at all. Um, and also there, there takes a lot of between the bats and the balls and the, the fields and the um, everybody has a little bit of grass and a lot of people have kickballs. They can go out and they can play soccer That's or they have true. somewhat of a rugby ball. They can go out in a green grass field and throw a, I don't even know what a rugby ball is called, but a rugby ball and they can sling that around. So you can get a group of guys to play soccer. You get a group of guys to play rugby against each other. Baseball, I think it's a little bit tougher, obviously, just when it comes to equipment and comes to getting a game going and then, um, just teaching the game of baseball, I think, um, I, like, once again, you said something about Sri Lanka. I, I, I know um, one of my good friends here is the, the Czech national baseball team coach, and he they kind of do mission trips of going to Europe to try to promote, obviously promoting the gospel, but also promoting uh, the game of baseball and mm -hmm. just bringing, like you said, bringing – bats and bringing equipment and bringing knowledge of the game obviously helps it expand and and the Czech have have uh, gotten a lot better in the last few years since my buddy has been coaching them but it starts from the bottom up once you can get okay. these guys and and uh and and kind of like Trevor was was saying if you can get the the grassroots you could get the the kids involved and the kids learning and having good coaches then I think once they start playing the game a little bit more and getting better at the game is when it would take off. But just trying to pick it up and have a, you know I mean? They're not going to go have a pickup game of baseball when they have never played, don't know the game, don't have equipment. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit tougher just to kind of get going. And mm -hmm. it's one of those things I think it really needs to be established. And like I said, maybe if you even picked a country in the middle, I'm not very good with geography, but in the middle or, or whatever, and kind of based it there and then let it expand kind of naturally on its own. I, I really don't know, but I, I think it could be obviously pushed out a little bit better, but I, I also think it's America's pastime. So they want to kind of keep it. Um, I mean, Japan it is called the world of, series, right? Even yeah. Though. I mean, Japan's the same, <laughs> Japan and Korea are the same way. Like, I mean, oh yeah, the, the, we'll watch highlights of MLB, but like this is, this is Japanese baseball here. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I it, it goes out true. of the country, but at the same point in time, it, it's like, yeah, they do stuff over there, but we do this a little bit better here. Or in Korea, like, oh, yeah, Japanese guys can slap the ball, but we hit more home runs here. Or, so, it, like I said, they all, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, not an ego, but it's a, it's a, just, that's how you, you feel about your own sport. So I, I don't mm -hmm. think they really want to, the Japanese players are not just going to go out and branch out and just start teaching American players their their tricks and their <laughs> pastime of how they do the game because they want to kind of keep it to themselves. But America's not over here trying to coach up the Japanese either. So mm -hmm. um, I okay. think it's, it's one of those tough subjects. Yeah. All right, guys, we've actually gone over time here. I'm getting the, the warning note from our engineer. Very enjoyable conversation. Again, Trevor, thank you so much for putting this together and participating. Everybody who's interested specifically in uh, Hunching Tigers, more broadly, Japanese baseball, Hunching Tigers English News, just Google that. It'll come up right away. And Jerry, thank you so much for sharing your experiences on being on the show. It was really nice to meet you and hear your story. You too. Thank you. Yep. So everyone, uh, thanks so much. I'll see you guys uh, in two weeks. We'll probably have to go back to uh, the hard subjects. I'm thinking of doing a panel on um, the impact of the Ukraine war. 
uh, in Japan with my uh, political scientist buddies at Kansai Gaide. That's what I'm planning for the next show. All right, everyone. Thanks again, you guys. Thank you, everyone, for watching. It's a wrap.